your Bibles, just open up where you feel like you're supposed to, and we'll see who's flown with the Holy Ghost, all right? We're going to see where we can get tonight. Uh, we've been talking about uh, walking in financial dominion, and now if this is your first time here, we've, we've been spending now uh, probably a couple months on this, and uh, we've been talking about the attitude of the heart, we've been talking about our commitment, consecration, dedication, affection, even walk, talked about addiction, didn't we? We've looked at some Old Testament figures and New Testament figures that they were not just walking in faith, but they were walking in just... Uh, they were absolutely in love with Jesus to where they lost all sense of human reasoning. Anybody that would sit and allow a king to throw you in a fiery furnace or let someone throw them in a, in a lion's den or let somebody beat them over and over again, stones multiple times, beaten with rods, abandoned by his own people and continued just to serve God. He said, one thing I have learned, Apostle Paul said, that I've learned to forget those things which are behind me, but I've pressed towards the prize and the mark of the high calling in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, sometimes we put a lot of emphasis on and say, man, what people of, of faith, and, and certainly do they did exemplify great faith, but really what was so, uh, you know, the main characteristic that they walked in was they just loved Jesus. And we, we've talked about that a little bit on Sunday. That a lot of times we put a lot of emphasis on faith, which rightly should be, because you can't be saved without it. You can't please God without it. You can't walk the Christian walk without it. Amen. And so without faith, it's impossible to please him. And we want to walk by faith. But I found out the more, I emphasis, the more emphasis I put on just loving Jesus, uh, I put myself in a position where faith's always coming and faith's always being released. It's just a love relationship, isn't it? And so it's not just about... You know, trying to, oh, I'm going to come to church and get my faith fed. Well, that's part of it. Um, my microphone's acting up. But um, chiefly, why are you here? I mean, you're here because you love Jesus, hopefully. Either that or somebody forced you to come. Twisted your arms. So if you don't go, you know, it's like, it's like I hear people a lot of times say, well, my, my son or daughter didn't want to come to church. It's like, that never worked for me. It's amazing we make them go to school, and sometimes parents even make them go to ball practice. You know that scripture that says, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old and not depart from it? You know that works with football too? Teach them to honor football when they're young, they'll be spending thousands of dollars on it when they're old. It's amazing. We, we teach our kids to be more faithful to ball than we do church. Now I'm preaching to the choir because you're here on Wednesday. But in our generation, you know, millennial generation, Z generation, X, Y generation, all them generations now we're serving, you know, really you're, some of your most faithful people now in Christendom come to church at least once a month, whether they need it or not. Amen. So, and we're in, so we're in a generation where, you know, the scripture in Revelation said we're the, we're the Laodicean church or the lazy church. Well, I don't, want, I don't want that to be descriptive of me. How about you? I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that at all. One thing that my dad taught me, he didn't teach me how to pray so much, but he taught me how to work. And he said, if you, wanna, if you like poverty, just, just be lazy. How many found out that to be true? You know, being poor is easy. You just don't do nothing. The Bible says a little folding of the hands, a little slumber, a little sleep. Just lay around in the bed. Poverty will come on you, won't it? So if you want to be poor, just do nothing. And here's the cool thing. If God wanted you to be the poor, he wouldn't have done nothing. But the Bible said this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and delivered him. Aren't you thankful? Do you ever have to cry out and say, oh, Lord, help me? Yeah. Amen. Did you all find your scripture I told you to go to yet? You're supposed to ask the Holy Ghost. I know some of you in tune. You're always telling you God sold this and God said that. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know if God told you that or not. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Amen. Well, let's look here in, uh, in Matthew. And just for the sake of reviewing, if you were here last Wednesday, you can probably go back over your notes. If you didn't take notes, you know, then uh, hopefully you had a real good memory because this is some life and death information that we're sharing with you. If, I mean, I'm not picking on you, but I was always a type, you know, no matter who's preaching, I'm going to write some stuff down. Amen? If it's important, you know, we'll write the grocery list down and then forget it and leave it on the refrigerator. <laughs> Amen. And, but I realize when you get to heaven, you're not going to get rewarded for taking the most notes. But if there's things important to you, You'd write it down. Praise the Lord. So, um, it is possible to live. Somebody say, it is possible. It is possible. To live free, free from financial stress. From financial stress. Looks your neighbor say, but it was kind of hard for me to believe. No, don't say that. I'm joking. Don't say that. It's possible, isn't it? Now, let's look at the, don't take my word for it. 
we're talking about financial prosperity. Uh, we've already found out. Don't take my word for nothing. <laughs> All right, Bill. <laughs> I ain't going to let you forget that one. Uh, but it don't work for you just because the preacher said it. You got to find it in the word. You got to find it in the scripture. And faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And I want to know what the Bible says about it. Because the enemy will, is going to come at you, and he'll send religious people that really love you, that have good intentions, to talk you out of your financial prosperity. When I went to Bible school, I had some instructors talk me out of financial prosperity. Uh, they had well intentions. They were trying to correct excesses that I didn't have. But in correcting excesses that I didn't have, it caused me to pull back out of a middle of the road and get over in the excess on the poverty side. And um, so let's look here what Jesus had to say about it. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he said, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Now this is the scripture I, I took the context or text from was verse 25 through 34 of Matthew chapter 6. We'll start reading there at 25. He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now how many realize that that's a commandment, not a suggestion? Looks your neighbor and say, don't worry. Don't worry. Be, happy. Be happy. You know that's scriptural? Some people think they're not spiritual unless they're worrying. But worry is a sin. Yeah. Right? Some people be real judgmental about somebody that fell into adultery, but they're worry warts. Amen? Causes all kinds of problems. Well, I'm not advising either one of the two. But don't worry. It's what Jesus said. Don't worry about your life, what you would eat, or what you would drink. Now, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about stuff that costs money, doesn't he? About your body or about what you'd put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. If you go on down, he, he hits us again because it's already 737 and I have got somewhere I want to get. But he says, therefore, do not worry, saying. So he says, do not worry at least twice there, doesn't he? Now, how would you worry, saying? Well, he goes on to even show you. He says, what shall we eat? How many ever asked that question? What are we going to eat? Now, it's not that bad of a decision if you have food or you've got money and you want to figure out which restaurant to go to after church, it's not that big of a deal. But if you've never uh, had to ask, what are we going to eat because you didn't have nothing? And most people in America, myself included, is very, I mean, I, I say I'm hungry. And so people say, well, I'm just starving. And most of us don't know what it's like to starve. And um, so we're blessed. But don't get comfortable, right? We're going to press on farther. He says, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And after all these things, the Gentile seeks. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about the unbeliever of the world or the natural person. He said, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Therefore, look what he says again, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is his own trouble. So, look at your neighbor and say, all right, I'm done with worrying. I'm, o I'm over it. Now, the only way you're going to be over worrying is it's going to take more than you just sh saying it here in church. You're not going to worry. You're going to have to replace the source of your frustrations. And it's going to be replaced with faith. We're talking about walking in financial dominion, and it requires faith to do so. We talked last Wednesday about the, the word of God being the seed that's sown. You t he's, talk, he's talking about financial prosperity. You're talking about in, in, in our circles. You start talking about seed, people automatically think about the money that you're sowing or the goods that you're sowing. But that, we went back to talk about this, that that's not the primary seed. The primary seed's the word. Jesus said the sower sows the word. Does he not? And we talked about the importance of that, that if you don't spend time in the word, then uh, there is nothing there to produce a harvest. In other words, if I just, you realize that people that preach against prosperity still give offerings and receive offerings. So what we want to emphasize here, it's more than just giving offerings. Because I'm talking to the Wednesday night crowd. And most of you guys, I mean, if you, if you weren't generous, you would have left months ago. Well, I was all got to talk about some money. Man, man, man. They're talking about money. Take up the offering. Take up the offering. Take up the offering. So you're still here. So you actually must believe that God wants you blessed. And, and some of you, if you're like me, you got so much seed in the ground, you're like, if I don't get a harvest, it's like, there better be a God. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I've got times to where I wasn't looking for 36 and 100 fold. I was just like, Lord, if you can just match me dollar for dollar right now, I'm in a bind. 
I've got some seed in the ground. I need a harvest. Praise the Lord. And so if it's more than just giving, it's more than just confessing scriptures, I want to know if there's a hindrance in my life that's holding back the blessing of the Lord. I want to know what it is so I can make those corrections. Anybody with me? And so in this, uh, we can see that we've got financial dominion, uh, really, first off, through the redemptive work of Christ. Though we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, although he was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich. Rich is not a cuss word. Rich is not something you're supposed to avoid. But rich is not something you're supposed to pursue after and give it all your, all your might, right? That's what Jesus said. The remedy for not being able to worry about things is to seek first the kingdom, not seek first money. Right? How many of you got an alarm clock? How many think it's the devil sometimes? It's like, what is this thing? Is it the devil? This thing's waking me up. I've been, I've been just so uh, sleeping so well. And then you hear that in your, in your dream, you're doing something, you hear this annoying sound. And you're trying to, it takes you a few minutes to realize, that's my alarm. I'm asleep. I hate that thing. But now what possesses us, even though we hate it, we slap it sometimes two or three times, and we crawl out of bed, why do we do that? What's our driving motivation? <laughs> Come on, somebody. It's, I mean, don't act like you're, you know, sister Bertha better than you, and you ain't never coveted anything. But no, the reason why we do most of the things that we do in life is because money makes every single decision of our life. And we're just too sometimes proud to admit it, but we're moved by money a lot. And if we're going to serve God, you can't serve money you got to pick one. The Bible says you'll love one and hate the other. It's pretty bold, isn't it? And so if I'm going to be a Christian, I want to be a good one that's not in love with money. But according to Scripture, I found out if I'm really in love with God, He'll make sure there's plenty of money. Amen. i got one person agreeing with me on that one. <laughs> so we've been talking about this for a few months. I would have figured I'd at least have three amens on that statement. Because if you're not convinced God doesn't want you blessed, I think it was F.F. F. Bosworth said, you can, it's impossible to boldly claim by faith a promise that you're unsure that God's offering. Faith begins where the will of God becomes known. If you don't know that God wants you blessed, you'll always fall through some kind of loophole that the devil opens for you. Amen? So we're not going to do that. I'm going to fi find out that I have got financial dominion. First off, I see it through the redemption in Christ Jesus. Right? And so if, if you ain't been taking notes... You don't know those things, maybe. But secondly, because of the Abrahamic covenant. Look at the things that Abraham was able to accomplish. And the blessing of God was upon him. Amen. It's just a basic provision of the law. If you ever went over and just looked at Deuteronomy 28? It's 743, but let's do that. Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Let's look and see what. If it's, if it's prosperity is part of... Uh, of the basic provision of the law. I mean, if Jesus wants us poor, let's just go wide open with being poor. But if he wants us blessed, let's go after it, right? Let's, pers let's pursue it. Uh, in other words, let's just look into it, meditate on it as we're following Jesus. Because I know a lot of you have a heart to please God, a heart to serve God, a heart to give. But how many would, uh, would testify that there, you know that there's more for you in the financial arena that you haven't walked in yet? Amen. So Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 says, It shall come to pass if, that's a big word, isn't it? If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, let me stop right there. Now, we're going to eventually get there, but essentially faith is obedience, isn't it? Faith is not just not worrying. Faith is not just quoting Scripture. Faith's doing the Word, which is essentially just doing the Word. Or look to your neighbor and say, obeying God. <laughs> you can't separate faith from obeying God. So he said, it shall come to pass. Shale's pretty, pretty, pretty strong. It shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Say, that's me. Say, I'm aiming to. <laughs> I'm fixing to. I'm getting ready to. If I ain't already been, I'm going to obey God. And he goes on to say, and to observe and carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Now, that's, that starts off pretty big, doesn't it? 
And these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Verse 3, blessed shall you be when you, in the city. Now, if you want to really study what blessing is, it just means empowered to succeed into the things that God says are good. These blessings will come upon you, overtake you, be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. Now, he goes on to start divining some of this. He said, empowered to prosper or blessed shall be the fruit of your body. The produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. This is all financial. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. This is your savings account, your storehouses, right? Blessed shall you be when you come in. And in case you forget about it, you'll be blessed when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, flee before you seven ways. Verse 8, the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Anybody fit that description in here? Let me see your hand. So if you didn't think you was already maybe fallen beneath the status that God had selected for you, then this kind of helps me say, you know what, Lord, maybe I'm not quite risen to the potential that you have for me. Let's keep on reading just a little bit longer. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, the increase of your livestock, the produce of your ground, the land which your, the Lord swore your fathers to give to you. The Lord will open his good treasure to the heavens to give rain in your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. Stop cursing your job. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Oh, my goodness. Ah. And the Lord will make you the head, not the tail. Look, you never said, don't be a tail. Said you should be above only and not beneath. I think the King James says never beneath. Say, I'm above only, never beneath. The Lord's making me the head or the leader. So it's fine for you to start out. Don't, the Bible says never despise small beginnings. But that doesn't mean you have to stay small. Let me just say it this way. If you've been an employee for the same place for 30 years and you're still at the bottom tier, you're doing something wrong. Because if you're obeying God then if that company won't promote you, then you've already obeyed God and followed him to a different company to where they're promoting you. Now, we don't follow money. We already talked about that, but we follow the Lord. But if you follow the Lord, he'll lead you in, a pla- in paths of abundance and where there's increase on you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so we read that verse 13 again. And the Lord will make you the head, not the tail. You shall be above only. Say, I'm above only. Above only. Not beneath. Now, what's that little word there after that word beneath? It's a big one. If. If. Oh, I see the problem here. (laughs) If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and you are careful to observe them. So we're not taking it lightly, are we? So we shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or the left to go after other gods or to serve them. Now, if you want to go on reading, you can read the rest of it. The rest of it is not near as exciting. But you'll find where he starts talking about the curse, and most of it's financial. So God didn't come to bring us the good news to the poor because if you're poor, he wants to make you poorer. Well, the good news to the poor is there's a solution for it. Amen? Somebody say, faith come by hearing. Hearing Hearing by the word of the Lord. Or hearing from God. Faith begins with the will of God is known. Hebrews eleven six says, Faith, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, just for the sake of clarification, because usually when we start hearing about prosperity, um, a lot of people, especially in our circles, automatically revert and go back to, well, I've got to change the way I'm giving. I want, I, want, I want to deal with this just a minute. 
it's not all contingent upon your giving. Giving is very important. But I'm talking to givers. I said, I'm talking to givers. And I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I've given myself to the point where I can't give anymore. Can I get a witness? I mean, I've done determined that I've refused to give more to the IRS than I give to Jesus every year. I don't tithe on my net. I tithe on my gross. Listen, if I was going to tithe on my net, then I would pay AEP and, and the gas bill and the water bill and then whatever I had left, and I'd tithe after that because that's the only thing I get. I refuse to give the government more than I give to God. I refuse to do it. Now, that's my conviction because the Bible says out of all your increase. In other words, so the first tenth is God's. It's not mine. I don't give it to him. I'm just a carrier of it. It might be like me owing a bill downtown, and I ask Lily, Lily, I owe a bill downtown. Here's the money to go pay my bill. And then if I weren't a tither, or, or to, to demonstrate what a non-tither would look like, then Lily would take my money that I give her to pay my bill, and she'd spend it on herself. Right. See, the tenth of what I've got is not mine. It's God's. God's just using me to handle it to pay, take care of his business for him. Amen. And so the part of your prosperity starts in tithing, but I know lots of tithers that still ain't blessed. Quiet in this Presbyterian church. I and mean, people have been tithers for 30 years and still living hand to mouth. Nobody's afraid of them. Not the head, not the tail. Still barely making it. Still making payments on your refrigerator. Huh? Come on now. I've been a faithful tither, and I'm not bragging on me. I have got a revelation of the Word of God right after I got married. And so now going on 20-plus oh, years, okay? And so we're every bit of my increase coming in to the point where now, I mean, God was able to give us last year a one-time gift. I gave a $10,000 gift. I'm not bragging on me. I'm not, I didn't start out that way. I didn't start out saying, well, you know, uh, Lord, uh, whenever I get an extra $20,000, i will give ten. No, I started out, but when I said, Lord, I'm going to give a thousand when I get a, when I get a thousand. And so I saved up a thousand and I give a thousand. But I first started where I was at. I remember the first gift that I gave was we, we started, got hungry for God, rededicated our life, got filled with the Holy Spirit before we were called into ministry. And I'm still serving every, every available avenue I can. I just loved it. I wanted to serve. We, we bought a sound system. The church that I was going to happened to be a charter member of the church, ended up being there. And uh, they needed, uh, they owed $500 on the sound system. And after the service, we got to the car. I told Consuelo, I said, I think we're supposed to pay that sound system off. Okay, we're 22 years old. And uh, just, just working, I think I was making about $14 an hour at the time. I was in the electrical uh, apprenticeship program. And so I'm learning, I'm working, I'm working hard. You know, but I'll do honestly with you, $500. I mean, you know, that's, that's more than a week's pay for me. Bring home. And so, but we're blessed. Amen. And so I felt like, well, we're supposed to give that sound system. Well, she got excited. Man, I'll tell you what, she's always been nuts. <laughs> Never try to talk sense into me. Like, are you kidding me? That's $500. Takes me two weeks to make $500. She said, let's do it. Well, we didn't have any checks. She opened her checkbook, no checks. How many of you ever run into that problem? We thought, well, that must be a sign from heaven. <laughs> no, we drove 15 minutes to the house. First off, I went in there and told the pastor, I said, how long are you going to be here? He said, I'll be here another hour or so. I said, well, don't leave till I get back. So I, went, I didn't tell him what I was doing. Went home, got the checkbook. Man, we cried and rejoiced all the way back. Glory to God, give $500. First, that's, a, that's the first time I've ever heard of anybody giving $500. And so, but here's the problem with that. That was 20 years ago. And I would have figured for sure, by now, I'd be building orphanages just out of my own resources. That I would be sending and financing at least seven or eight different missionary families on each continent out of my own finances. But you know what? It ain't happening. I said, it ain't happening. Now, God's blessing us. And we're certainly a lot further along than we were. But it's not just about giving. I said it's not just about giving. It is a major part of it. And without seed sown, there's not going to be a harvest. But I'm, I'm talking to sowers. 
I know, as a matter of fact, most of you are generous, prompt to do it, givers. Man, you, I, know, I know some of you would give the very shirt off your back if you knew somebody needed it worse than you did. But we're still not being set above all nations, are we? So let's read on here. Hebrews eleven six. Notice it didn't say, without offerings, it's impossible to please God. Now, a lot of so-called prosperity preachers, which I happen to be one, they would make that emphasis that without offerings, it's impossible to please God. And you know what? If the Lord show, told you to give an offering, you refused, and at that moment, you'd be in unbelief, and you'd be disobedient, which you wouldn't be pleasing God. But my emphasis tonight is not just on the giving. You've got to mix faith with everything you do. And it's got to be prompted by an act of faith. A lot of people have seen somebody else give a generous offering and get a generous return, and so they just did that because their buddy did it. Didn't have a clue what they was doing. Matter of fact, in many cases, people have done that, and it's almost like an under witchcraft because they're trying to manipulate God into being a blessing to them. But their heart wasn't in it. Remember, we did, a whole, we did a whole service, maybe two different services, on give me your heart. God said, give me your heart, not your cash. Now, we found out if God's got your heart, he's going to have your cash because it's all his anyways. We brought nothing into the world. We're taking nothing out. Never seen, you know, a hearse pulling a U-Haul, have a luggage rack. Right? You, can't, you, can't, you can send it ahead, but you can't take it with you. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. So let's, let's examine for a few moments what does faith look like concerning my finances. What would it look like? Well, we already read the scripture in Matthew where Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things will be added to you. And in the midst of seeking first the kingdom of God, guess what you're not doing? You're not worrying. Because if God's my source, why would I be tempted to worry when the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and he's my dad, and I'm trusting him, and I'm in covenant with him? No temp- Listen, I, mean, I love that when Bill gives his testimony. God can't lie. If he so clothes the birds of the air and the grass of the field, how much more value are you than those things? He takes good care of us, doesn't he? Now Habakkuk 2.4 says, The just shall live by faith. It didn't say the just shall live by offerings, did it? It said the just shall live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Genesis 8.22 says the earth remains. There is seed time and harvest shall not cease. And remember, it's the seed of the word that's going to produce a harvest. Just money seed alone is not enough. I've emptied out my bank account and got no return. What's the problem? I did what the Bible said. Well, evidently, there wasn't any faith active. Or either that or I turned loose of it at some point. Or if you look back and review what we talked about last Wednesday, I stopped watering the seed. Several variables here. And what it boils down to, if you stay in love with Jesus, you stay in the Word, you stay active, and not get distracted by the cares of the world. If it's possible to empty out your bank account, listen, um, you better be prompted by the Holy Ghost. Now, you can't outgive God, and I'm not went hungry. I think I'm heavier now <laughs> than I was when I give that first $500 offering. <laughs> the only meals I've ever went without, well, with the exception when I was at Bible school, I went out when that went without a few meals. But it didn't hurt me any. You know, there comes a time in every person's life where they have to learn how to depend on God. Sometimes we got to be very careful as parents. We never let our kids make it on their own. Let me say it this way. If your kid's 50 years old and still depending on you, it ain't the kid's fault. Look straight ahead. Come on now. Never is a big word, but I have never had to call my parents and ask them for money. I'm 43 years old. Listen, because I'm going to tell you something. 
I will sell my right leg before I ask somebody for money. You think I'm exaggerating? I don't know how much I get for it. We're kind of skinny. I don't wear shorts because it looks like I'm hitchhiking, riding piggyback on an ostrich. <laughs> the Bible says, King David said, I was old, I was young, but I'm now old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken of their seed begging for bread. I refuse to beg because God said I don't have to. Come on now. Now, I got in some tight spots, Lily, where I thought, oh, Jesus. Who I got on the speed dial? <laughs> we were at Raymond. We were running out of money. Anybody ever run into that? You run out of money, you run out of funny. I'm telling you what, you can't have much fun without money. And, uh, and we decided, you know what? We're just going to do what the Bible says. You know, there's times you do things you know it's the will of God. I mean, you just, you, there's a spirit of faith in it. And that's the this, that's this thing with, with Christendom nowadays. We're so far removed uh, from the spirit of faith, we've got a knowledge of the word and we call that faith, but it's not faith at all. It's almost trying to talk ourselves into doing what the word says do, but there's no conviction in it. Faith is not, uh, it's faith is not just agreeing with what the word says. Faith is a spiritual force. Somebody say force. Or if you have a list, it's a fourth. The fourth be with you. Let me start all over. Faith, say that three times fast and then laugh at me, would you? Faith is a spiritual force that controls everything about you. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we believe and therefore speak. One of the first evidences that you believe God <laughs> is your actions. But some people are faking it. Have you ever faked it? I have. In other words, I wanted to be in faith, so I did the word, but I did it about with, with, with swimmies on. Anybody ever did that? You ever jumped in the pool over your head, but you had your swimmies on, little floaties? You know what those things are? I can remember the first time I got in a swimming pool, I had swimmies and a life jacket on and still wouldn't turn loose to the side of it. I can remember that. It was tormenting. <laughs> but I was still in the pool. You know what? I wasn't enjoying it. A lot of people are doing the word. I mean, only because they know they're supposed to, but they're not enjoying it. You know why? Because there's no spirit of faith. If I'd have been in faith, I'd have run dead my cannonballs. Have you ever seen Home Alone? Do you mind if I work on my cannonballs? <laughs> Y'all quit laughing at me when I say something funny. Unless I tell you it's okay to laugh. <laughs> Write this down. God's word is the covenant platform for prosperity. And faith is our covenant access to it. Just agreeing with the word is not sufficient. I like what Pastor Mark Hankins says. He said, faith come by hearing. He said, when faith comes, you know it. Because nothing else makes sense but the word. If we're going to be blessed, financially blessed, there's got to be a spirit of faith active in us. And there can't be a spirit of faith active in us if we're not actively meditating in the word. Faith come by hearing. I love the way Bishop Boy Depo says it. That scripture, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He says faith really comes from hearing from God. You know, it's possible for you to read the word and not have any faith generated by it. You know how I know that? Because there's tons of people teaching Bible doctrines in Bible schools, and they ain't got one ounce of faith of what, about what they're teaching. Faith just in the Word alone, or just in a words written on a page, you've got to see that this Word's alive. Living faith will carry you. Of dead faith, you'll have to carry it. In other words, if you, if you, if we, if you have to have a Scripture in front of you, and meditate on that. 
Okay, if you forget about that scripture, it's not living in you. There was a, if you come up against a problem, and the problem seems bigger to you than the promise in the word, there's no faith active there. When faith is active, you get a negative report that's contrary to the word, but it makes no sense. Because all you can comprehend at the moment is what the Bible says because it's more alive in you than the report that you're getting that's contrary to the word. Faith is a living force that controls your words, controls your actions. When the first place you see faith show up is in your obedience or your actions. James said, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. When God told Abraham, Abraham, take the son that you love and go sacrifice him. The Bible says he arose early the next morning and hearkened into the voice of the Lord and went to do what God told him to do. How do I know faith's active in Abraham? Well, we call him the father of faith, but what did he do? He obeyed God. His actions testified, and the Bible said he had already received his son raised back to life in a vision. What is that? It's a spirit of faith. He's seeing beyond the now. Faith will take every opportunity and see the answer on the other side of it. That's what Jesus said, whoever says unto this mountain. Faith don't just see the mountain. Faith sees what's on the other side of it. Faith doesn't complain about the mountain. Faith talks to the mountain. But how many of us, myself included, you talk to the mountain and the mountain was still scaring the spit out of you? It's a big mountain because we've researched it. And this particular kind of mountain that I've got is a special kind of mountain that really only one out of 99 has. And this particular mountain that I've got, matter of fact, it's got even some extra complicated strings attached to that. And we're so well versed in our mountain. And we know more about the mountain than we do the power that we have on the inside of us. And the reason why most of us are falling prey to a poverty, survival, barely get by mentality is because we're more aware of the life circumstances and problems we know we're living in an oppressed society. You know, the dollar's not like it used to be. You know, I'm talking about back when money was money. How many of you ever heard that said? What the world does that even mean? i tell you what it means is when people had some of it. Money is not the same as a good credit score. We've been bought into this lie. And it's preached from pulpits. No, you better watch those excesses when it comes to finances. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people got off on it because they had no character. Money will corrupt you if you've got a corrupt heart. We've seen it happen dozens of times. God bless people. They got enough money to buy a bass boat. Now they're at the lake on Sunday instead of church. In other words, they're here faithfully when they're unemployed. And it's funny, when they get a job, they can get up Monday through Friday, but Sunday they can't find the alarm clock. While they're worshiping, it ain't Jesus. It's the almighty dollars what they're chasing. Then they wonder why they're having problems in their marriage, in their home, in their finances. Well, because the only thing you can answer is what your God will answer for, which is the dollar. Money can't heal you. Money can't save your kids. Now, it answers a lot of problems. Ecclesiastes says it answers all things, but really, it's the pursuit of it. What are you pursuing? I promise you, you're holding whatever it is. Luke 145 says, Blessed is she, talking about Mary, for she believed it. She believed that there should be a performance of those things which were told to her. How did... Mary received strength in her body to conceive seed when she had not been with a man. Well, the Bible says she believed the word. She believed the word, and it was performed unto her. Faith's in your heart. There's going to be actions to testify. 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The scripture says, By grace we're saved. Hashtag through faith. Grace is a gift given to every man. But the only people that's accepting it and operating in it is the people who apply it. A faith to it. The gospel, it's possible to have the gospel message preached about financial prosperity, but you not be convinced and you not act on it. I mean, you can agree with it. Nod your head, say amen, even shake. Hallelujah. And still be broke 10 years from now. Still giving offerings. Still faithfully giving of your tithes. Looking out after the poor. But still broke. Come on now. Still barely getting by. Got to take up a collection at your funeral to bury you. It's not fitting. It's not, the, it's not the plan of God. The Bible says a good man will leave an inheritance to his children's children. I get so disgusted. I get on RMAI updates, because that's the ministerial affiliation that I'm with, Raymond Ministerial Association International. And it's amazing. Nine times out of ten, when I get an announcement saying someone has gone to be with the, be with the Lord, underneath it it says, uh, donations suggested to help with the expense of the burial. I was like, are you kidding me? They've been in ministry for 50 years. They didn't even have enough sense to buy life insurance. You can buy a burial plan for about $20 a month. Come on, somebody. Preaching prosperity, no doubt. Laying hands on the sick, casting out devils. Can't pay for their own funeral. Does that look like Deuteronomy 28? 1 through 11? No, it doesn't. What's the problem? Are they good people? Yeah, they're good people. They love Jesus. They've given their life for the gospel. Take them 37 months to raise money to buy a new refrigerator for the church kitchen. Come on, somebody. I know we're, we're immune to this kind of stuff. We're blessed. But is it to the degree that God wants us to be blessed? Listen, if we're seeking first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, the Bible says all these other things that the Gentiles, man, people are running crazy just to be able to get their bills paid. Just to be able to get a few extra dollars to be able to take a few days off work to take their family on vacation, but they're struggling to get there, and they're stressed about it. You know, most divorces are 80% approximately are money-related. You know, churches are closing the door every single day, not because the pastor committed adultery. It's because of no money to operate. I was talking to a lady the other day. She said, I want you to pray for our church. I said, why? Well, yeah, I, I thought, because the last I'd heard, they didn't have a pastor. She said, no, we got a pastor. We ain't got no money. I was like, how is my prayer going to help that? I don't know what they're teaching. Because if you're teaching poverty, the Holy Ghost works with and confirms the word with signs following. You're preaching poverty, you're living it. Well, that's that, that's that rich church. That's that blessed church. They talk about money all the time. Yeah, and we got some of it. And we come by it honestly. We can track every penny where it's spent, where it goes. Paper trail and electronically. We're good stewards of it. In other words, the churches, you know, most churches are run by people in the pastor's back pocket. Come on now. I touch none of the money that comes in. Nuh-uh. I don't want to see it, but I'm called it in, glory to God. <laughs> we never have one person alone with the money. Takes two people counting it, two people carrying it back to the office, putting the safe. Then we have to do reports for every month, showing where every dime, every dime that come in, where every dime went. We got a paper trail for every bit of it. That's why it's a funny thing to me. Somebody said, well, you know, so-and-so's left with the money. It's like, I don't know how they'd get it. They don't have access to it. It takes two of us to write a check. 
And so we're staying above reproach. Don't let your goods be spoken evil of, right? right. right. Amen. If I'm here by myself, the doors are locked. Because I'm not going to be here with somebody of the opposite sex that ain't my wife. I don't counsel with single or married women by myself. I don't even text single or married women by myself. I do them in a group. Either my wife or their spouse or somebody else is in the text message with them. Occasionally, people keep sending me messages by themselves, and I'll respond to them occasionally. But if I'm initiating it, I always have my wife in there with it. I want to stay above reproach. But most churches and most ministries and most homes are failing, not because of infidelity. It's because of poor financial management. And it stresses everybody to the hilt. But then you're not allowed to talk about money at church because they all think all you want is the money. And most incarcerations are money-related. Most crime in this community is drug-related, which really centers on money or the lack thereof. Come on now, we've got to get this. As the body of Christ, God cannot afford for us, the church of these last days, that's supposed to be preaching the gospel with signs and wonders and demonstrations, miracles, signs and wonders, but can't pay to get out of town. It's not the plan of God. He wants us so abundantly blessed that we're not just trying to pay the church off, that we're building hospitals, we're building schools, we're sending missionaries. That's the plan of God. He never called us to have to be at Walmart selling corn dogs. We're going on a mission trip. Would you buy a hot dog for crying out loud? No. If you can't afford to send yourself to the mission trip, you ain't got no business going. What are you carrying when you get there? What do you have to give? Ministry is about being a distribution center, not gimme, 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 my name's Jimmy. And we hear this stuff all the time. We all hear, take the money. I know the church needs the money. Who said the church needs it? I don't give because the church needs it. I give because I'm connected to God. And when I invest in the kingdom, man, it comes back to me 30, 60, and 100 fold because I'm connected to something that of his kingdom, there shall be no end. So I'm going somewhere because I'm coveted, connected to God and his plan and his words alive and well on the inside of me. And so I'm not motivated by need, and I'm certainly not motivated by money. I didn't come to Logan, West Virginia because I wanted money. I had a job. I've had to tell previous employers. I was looking for a job when I found this one. Right? Who gets to be called to California, you know? San Diego, 72 degrees year-round. Hawaii. It's like, Lord, what did I do wrong? I'm just messing with you. God gave me vision of the mountains years before I came here. I was like, I could really see myself living in a place like that. Isn't that funny how God gives you the desires of your heart? I don't like flat land. It's boring. I was raised on a farm, and we had one, our cattle, our, they were all, we took them to market, and they all walked to the sales ring like this. Why is that? One leg short, another been walking around the hillside. <laughs> I like the hills. But I didn't come here chasing money. The board will tell you, I never discussed money when we came, took this job. I, I, we didn't even discuss money until after all I said, all right, I'm coming. Even if I, I even told them, even if i got to pay you to come, I'm coming to this church to pastor. I'm discussing the compensation package. I'm chasing money. I'm being led by the Holy Ghost. How can I be led by the Holy Ghost if money's making my decisions? Well, you can't buy that one because we can't afford that one. Let's just shop on the 75% off rack all the time because we know God needs the money. Let's save it. It's like churches has got millions of dollars in the bank, but they still have a fundraiser to buy a new refrigerator. It's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You know, I'll tell you what that is. It's fear of running out. You don't want to turn loose of anything you got. That's the only way it's going to come back to you. Amen? 
So how do you know you're in faith? Your actions testify. I don't have to ask whether or not in your faith. I can tell by looking at you. I watch you long enough. You can fake it a while. But some things you can't fake. You can get happy at church, shout, run. But the proof's in the pudding. Is there supernatural confirmation in your life? Right? Is it there? Well, I just love the Lord. Hallelujah. I love Jesus. But there's no evidence that you love him other than you telling everybody, Oh, I just love the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's no evidence. Right? We all know people like that. Biggest gossips in town, but they're the best worshipers. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jokingly, we'd say this when we were raised up. We had, had long hair, long dresses, long faces, and even longer tongues. Judging everybody, every Tom, Dick, and Harry didn't look like them, worship like them, dress like them, talk like them. Condemning everybody to hell, and they're all going to hell. No wonder their faces were so long. Miserable. Broke. Come on, somebody. Well, it's the truth that sets us free, is it not? If you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Are you financially free? Come on now. There must be some truth missing. And we know what the Bible says. It's not quite enough, is it? If I can quote you all the financial scriptures, does that make me blessed? If I give an ever offering, does that that guarantee me being blessed? If I give to the poor every time, I'm I'm taking my shoes off to give to the poor. I'm just barefooted. I mean, without doing it, motivated by the Spirit of God, and there's faith swelled up in my heart that I can't help but act the way that I act, not because I'm trying to impress somebody or because I'm trying to meet somebody's need that God didn't even call me to meet. Need does not always... It doesn't mean you're always supposed to meet every need. God doesn't move... He's not moved by need. If He was moved by need, there would be no needs. Well, the Lord knows what we have need of. And that's how people pray. What's that mean? you got to finish that. He knows what we have need before we ask him. And what's James said? Well, if you ask, you got to ask in faith. You know how you know if you're in faith or not? If you get what you ask for. Because the Bible says, he that asks, receives. To him that knocked, it shall be opened. Well, I just don't know why. I prayed and I prayed and God never answered my prayer. You was not guaranteed to get an answer when you prayed if you didn't pray in faith. Just because you mouthed the words. You cried out in desperation. It's the same concerning financial prosperity. We know the scriptures i got a flyer here in case you don't. I mean, there's at least 20 scriptures on here. I'm not going to ask you, but hypothetically, I will. How many of you had these flyers and you ain't looked at it for months, but yet you're in financial need? Because if we really believed it, we'd be devouring it. You know, I don't, I, I said this before, I don't forget to eat. Now, sometimes I'll get busy, <laughs> work through lunch. But you know, after a day or two, it's almost like something missing. Oh, I ain't had nothing to eat for a few days. I imagine that. And I don't mean to be, you know, facetious and sarcastic, but it's a gift. <laughs> it's a gift of the Spirit. It's the 10th gift for me. But you don't forget stuff that's important to you. It's like we have people said, you know, I've been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit for 37 years. Not very hard, you ain't. Because he certainly ain't running from nobody. 
Well, a lot of times just out of ignorance. They didn't know that they didn't have to wait for the Holy Spirit because he had already been given 2,000 years ago. So they were taught how to tarry. But you know what? I've just found out the people that were taught how to tarry, if they stayed in love with Jesus, they come out praying in tongues. Because you have what you want. As a matter of fact, you do have what you want. If not today, give it a few weeks, you'll end up with it. If you really want something, we know what you want by what you got. If you're married, look straight ahead. How would I get stuck with this then? Explain that to me. It's called mercy. God didn't want you to be alone. (laughs) So where's the first place the evidence of faith shows up? In your actions. Secondly, in your words. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? And so when you can school yourself into faith, because I'm, I'm talking to some people, I know you're generous. I know you know the scriptures. Might be a few of you. This is new to you. But just hang around. You can be as happy as we are, but still without no money. I'm just messing with you. We're not staying that way. See, here's the cool thing. I don't have to have money to make me happy. I do have to have money to do what God called me to do. Matter of fact, if the plan you've got picked out for your life don't require you to have an abundance, then you're not thinking in line with God's plan. Because everything that God had people do was something they couldn't afford to do on their own. You know, if God really wanted you poor, I mean, when uh, the prophet was there at the brook and he was having to fly quail in <laughs> and he was having to fly food in, but the ravens was feeding him and he was drinking, you know, out of the branch. But the brook dried up. You know, if God wanted him to be poor, he'd have said, well, that's good. Just die right there, son. And then, if he, furthermore, if he really wanted him poor, when he sent him to the widow, and then when he got there and found out, you know, that she was broke, <laughs> God would have said, well, just good. Just tell her that's what I got for her in this lot in life. I want you to be broke and poor and die prematurely, and I'll go to the next widow and make sure they're the same state she's in. No, but God sent the man of God to the widow's house, and both of them was sustained. Because why? The word of the Lord. Because he acted on the word that he heard. God said, I want you to go to Zarephath. He said, there's a widow there that I've called to sustain you. And then when he got there, knocked on the door, she didn't have nothing. He's like, must be the wrong house. Because see, if it had been Christians... And God sent us somewhere, we'd have been looking for the brick house. The big one, the three-story one. Extra cars in the driveway. said, this must be where God's called me to go. No, God called him probably most likely to the poorest person in the community. He said, because I'm going to sustain you there. Listen, if the word of God won't work for you in Logan, it won't work for you in California. If the word you believe won't work for you now... Is it going to work for you tomorrow or 10 years from now? No, you make the word work for you right now by acting on it and then professing it out of your mouth. Second place that your evidence of your faith is going to be coming out of your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we can find out what you believe by listening, not by what you say in church. Mark eleven twenty four 24 doesn't say you'll have whatsoever you say in church. Matter of fact, I even think church might be excluded. Because anybody can say it when there's anointing on you. Amen. Your actions, your words, we believe and therefore speak, right? What are we saying about the situations? And then thirdly, obedience. So you're acting like you're in faith. And the first thing's going to happen is your face is going to light up. You're happy. You're acting upon the word. And then also that God gives us commands, doesn't he? Now, King David said, I rejoice at your word like one having found a great treasure, a great spoil. But, you know, he didn't just rejoice the word over the word. He did the word. It would be one thing for me to rejoice thinking, oh, God, look at Malachi 3.10. I'm just so thankful that the devourer is rebuked. Yeah, but it's one thing for me to worship and magnify God over the word but then not be a tither. In other words, not do the word. The prophet would have not been sustained, and the widow and her son would have died had he not went to her house. 
And then she would not have seen a harvest if she had not obeyed the prophet or the word of God. We'll go fix me a cake first. Sound just like a big fat preacher, don't it? Could you imagine if that happened today? Prophet goes to widow's house, takes morsel of bread from dying child for himself. But the miracle was in her doing the word. You know, most time, most Christians ain't got enough sense whether or not the prophet is speaking out of frustration or from the word of God. No discernment. It's not one of the nine gifts. It just means having a clue spiritually. You know, most people don't know the difference between anointing and talent. Boy, that service is so anointed. I was like, I never felt nothing. The guitar got off tune. Oh, that killed the spirit. No, it just killed your flesh. Because if you're in the spirit, you ain't paying no attention to every little detail. You're clued into God. Now, I'd rather have better music than worse music. Amen. But it's the anointing that makes a difference, doesn't it? And the anointing's on the word. And so if you speak the word, you obey the word, get excited about the word, it'll produce results for us, won't it? Now, I've went about long enough, not because I'm done, because y'all are. I'm just getting warmed up. I got, to, I got my review over with. The Bible says it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. You cannot separate faith and obedience. You can listen to the message all day long. You can rejoice over it. Oh, the word was good. But if you don't do the word, you're not going to see any increase. You're not going to see any increase. And it's more than just doing what the preacher said do. You got to spend time alone with God and allow the impartations of the word to take root in you to where it's, it's alive in you. People come to me sometimes concerning sickness and disease, and they say, well, you know, uh, I've got such and such prescription. Do you think I ought to quit? And I no, because you won't be asking me. If it gets to the point, I mean, you, you, won't, you won't have to ask me when it's time to lay down your prescription. Man, I'll tell you what, it's amazing how you still get persecuted over talking about heal, over healing. You know, it's, like, it's, it's almost like I come up with it or something. Like, man, you're making people feel guilty because you don't have a medicine cabinet. And the doctor said that they got to take this. I was like, who said it? Who, who said they had to take it? Oh, you want me to preach what the doctor says? You want me to preach what Jesus said? That's right. right. So don't get mad at me because the word ain't working for you. Somehow it's my fault. Y'all prayed for me and I'm still sick. Well, I take full responsibility. If you get healed, we'll give God all the glory. Come on now. We can only go to the promised land and carry back fruit so long. God doesn't have a welfare program. You don't have entitlements. You don't get wiser by getting older in the kingdom. He doesn't have a seniority plan. Well, you've been in it 30 years. We're going to give you a higher rank. That don't work with God. He said, matter of fact, he said, if you're going to excel in the kingdom, he said, you're going to come to me as a young child. Lord, you come to me like, all right, Lord, teach me. Show me. I'm just glad to be here. Right? And so we want, when we're looking at these truths, don't sit there and pretend like you already know all this. Amen. Because I don't. I don't. I don't have this all nailed down yet. I'm still working. Me and Jesus got my own thing going. You know what's I'm just cluing you in on it. He's helping me to see, uh, son, you're still ignorant in a lot of these areas. You ain't doing some things right. Now, I'm not trying to disqualify what you're doing. I'm just talking about me. I'm just cluing you in on my own meditation time. Right? Because I haven't seen, you know, a million dollars come in off my $10,000 seed yet. And you know what? I didn't do it trying to get one. I felt impressed by the Holy Ghost to ask for seed, supernaturally seed come in. I didn't have $10,000 to give. Like I'm just going out writing $10,000 checks. Well, that would be nice, but I ain't there yet. Still own my house, still own pickup truck, 
Still got a few more payments on my refrigerator. But I still wrote a $10,000 check. So you know what? It's coming in. It came in, and I wrote it. Well, I could have used that money. Doggone right, I could have used that money. But I'm connected to something that's bigger than I am. And I ain't turning loose of it. And the devil thought that was it. I'm just getting warmed up yet. I'm just 43. There's a lot more than $10,000 offerings in me yet. But don't fret. I'm not asking you for mine. Matter of fact, what I've received in life is, has nothing to do with the gifts you gave me. It has everything to do with my gifts I gave. I'm not depending on your gifts you've given to me. You ain't rich enough to take care of my needs. Because I got a big vision. I said, I got a big vision. And it's going to take more than just pinto beans and cornbread to get it done. Amen. Y'all happy? Are you thinking big as I am? Let's think bigger. Let's challenge it. Let's just think outside of the box here. Let's not let Taco Bell outdo us. Well, no, that's just the way we've always done it here now. Well, I know that's why it don't work. If you're happy with what you got, you can stay there. I'm not. I'm not happy with what, with the... I mean, I'm satisfied in one sense. I'm content, but, man, there's more to do. There's still billions of people on the world in the world that's not saved. Some big chunks coming in for me. How about y'all? I'm going to keep watering the seed that I've sowed. God said, give seed to the sower. So I was like, Lord, I still got to make my obligation. I told you I was going to pay for 50 of these chairs. You know how many I got paid for? Four. Oh, I could have claimed four and took care of them. But I was like, I'm not settling with four. Come on now. I'll make the devil mad. I'll sell my pickup truck if I have to. It ain't that far to walk. I mean, the church provides me with an automobile. I can ride a Mercedes and get rid of the Toyota. I mean, I'm a truck person. You know, you got to have mud tires. And if all I had was a little small SUV, I'd have to drive them my pinky sticking out. I need something with a brush guard on it. You know what I'm saying? But I'm telling you, I'm committed to it. If I have to sell my truck to finish my obligation, I will. I got a bicycle. I can ride to church. It's good exercise. I'm not, that's what I'm telling you is don't be settled where you're at. We're moving here. We're going forward. Amen. Amen. Are you in faith about it? Well, your words and your actions and your obedience will be testifying of it. And it's like Bishop Oedipo says, we'll know if you believe it or not. Just wait till tomorrow. If anything comes of it, we know you're in faith. Look at your neighbor say, get in faith. It's 839. I can't believe you'd preach this long on Wednesday.